Good morning. Thank you guys all for being here. I really appreciate it. Today is going to be part four of understanding home features. So, so far in the four parts, we've talked about interior features, we've talked about appliances, we've talked about pools and seawalls, and today we're going to talk about exterior building materials. Now, I'll give you guys, this is not super riveting material. Um, you know, we're talking about exterior building types and we're talking about roofs and you know I get it's not super exciting but I promise you guys there's some really good stuff in here that will help kind of get you understanding what it is so that when you take new listings ultimately that's been my goal with this whole series of classes is as you guys start to take listings you really have kind of a robust comprehensive understanding of the different aspects that go into a home so that as you're really getting this idea of, you know, what is this? Or when I fill out my MLS profile sheet, what is it that they're asking? And so that way we have kind of a good thorough understanding of what it is so that we can do a better job at being the expert. So how do you understand, or how do you better understand the various features and functions of the home? That's kind of the, the overreaching theme here. So today we're gonna to talk about the different exterior construction types. We're going to understand the differences in value for the types of roof coverings. We're gonna evaluate the types of patios and porches. We're going to discuss the impact of landscaping and curb appeal. And then we're gonna establish the best way to market these features in your MLS listing and other marketing pieces. So there are primarily seven types of homes, I guess you could say. There are wood frame, timber frame, wood panel or SIP homes, manufactured homes, insulated concrete, concrete masonry or steel studs. So those are the, the kinds of materials that homes are typically made from. And then manufactured homes are kind of the one-off um, because they are actually manufactured offsite and then brought into the location basically. But we're gonna talk about that. If at any point as we go along, if you guys have questions, certainly feel free to pop in the chat and it'll pop up and notify me and we can, can stop and talk about those. So the first one is wood frame homes. Now for a very, very long time in the history of real estate, this is the most common type of construction. Much more so than block or brick or anything else, wood frame construction has been around for hundreds of years. The wall studs are milled to either two by four or two by six, and then finished with some other type of material. Usually you're gonna have a siding or a stucco or a stone accent, but the actual frame of the home itself is all wood. Now, what's really interesting is I have watched, especially because I live in Trinity, I've watched all this new construction go up along the 54 corridor. And even a lot of these new homes that are being built are actually wood frame. Um, some of the uh, condo buildings, the only thing on the entire building that is block is the stairwell. So you see this cinder block stairwell and then everything else is wood frame. So it's really interesting, but this has really been the main type of construction for a very, very long time. The second one is timber frame. So it's very similar to the wood frame, except they use large wooden beams between the roof beams and then wood studs between the columns. So if you look at this top right picture, you'll see these very large beams that come in to support this frame structure. What's different between a wood frame home and a timber frame home is that inside, they typically leave this timber exposed. So it's very much a different aesthetic than you're going to get with a wood frame home, which is going to have your typical ceilings and, you know, kind of your finished drywall ceilings and walls and things like that. Your timber frame is going to be much more open and exposed and just give you a very different feel. Now, we don't see a ton of timber frame homes in Florida, except kind of up in the panhandle. Uh, when I have been visiting friends up there near Pensacola and Panama City, uh, I have seen a few of these homes that were kind of more available. 
So you're not going to probably come into a lot of this, especially in the Tampa Bay, Central Florida, South Florida markets, but it is something that is used in Florida. So in the event that you see it, just kind of understand the differences. Then we have what are called wood panel or SIP homes. Now these are growing in popularity. So unlike timber frame homes, the wood panel homes use prefabricated wall and roof panels that sandwich a rigid foam insulation between the thinner pieces of wood. So if you look here in this top picture, you have these two pieces of wood, and then right here, you can kind of see this white foam that's in between the two panels of wood. So they're very efficient, they're growing in popularity, but all of these pieces are prefabricated. So they only come in a particular size or shape or things like that. So you're not going to really be able to customize, hey, I wanna push this wall out five feet or you know, make any kind of changes with a builder that's using SIP home or SIP material. And basically SIP is structurally insulated panel. So again, structurally insulated, meaning it uses a very rigid foam in between that wood to be able to keep pests out, to make it very energy efficient. Um, so we're seeing a lot of this pop up, especially in Northeast Florida. I grew up in Jacksonville. I still have a lot of family there. And a couple of my friends from high school are actually building this style home. And it's kind of interesting to me because it's stronger than wood frame. It's hurricane resistant, similar to a block home, but it increases your energy efficiency in the home by leaps and bounds over both block and wood frame. Typically, the wood frame homes make use of timber or trees, whereas this is a, um, or the timber and trees rather, sorry, I was getting ahead of myself. Wood frame homes make use of timber trees, a renewable resource, and are relatively inexpensive to construct. So all these pieces get shipped in on a truck. So the big exterior wall, the interior walls, the roof pieces, all of that come in, and then they just use a crane to drop them in place. So as opposed to some of the others where, you know, they have to pour a concrete foundation and then they have to lay it block by block and they have to do all those things, these actually come in in pieces and can be assembled fairly quickly. I've actually been told that they can put a house like this from pouring the foundation to certificate of occupancy in less than six weeks. That's electrical, that's plumbing, that's everything. So these are kind of a cool way to be able to get a home built inexpensively, efficiently, and really in a way that is environmentally conscious. conscious. Then we have manufactured homes. So manufactured prehab, you might hear them called mobile homes, manufactured homes, uh, modular homes. There's a bunch of different names for them, but at the end of the day, they're all effectively the same thing. And basically what it means is they use components that have been constructed elsewhere in large numbers. And then what they do is they actually bring the completed home to your property. Manufactured homes, which buyers can have delivered to a lot anywhere and can be placed with or without a permanent foundation, also use prefabricated components. Now, this is where it gets to be interesting. A mobile home does not have a concrete foundation. They typically use straps that hold it in place and they have anchors or rebar or something in the ground that it's actually used to hold that in place. But with a lot of these manufactured and mobile homes, in the event that you decide, hey, I want to move, you can actually have the entire home moved. So it is a little bit different. But to look at some of these manufactured homes, you would have a very hard time identifying this, like the one in the bottom left specifically. You would have a hard time identifying that as a manufactured home as opposed to a regular constructed home, you can have garages um, that are actually built on foundations and things like that that attach right to it. So they have come a very, very long way from the 1960s and 70s when you know you had these mobile home parks basically, which we still have to an extent, but some of these new modular manufactured homes are very, very efficient in terms of 
excuse me, bang for the buck. Then we have what are called insulated concrete form homes. Now, honestly, guys, these things absolutely amaze me. I watched one of these get built, um, gosh, it's been a few years ago now. Uh, a friend of mine up in Northeast Florida was having this style home built. And so I took my drone up and kind of did the video of how they put this up. And it was just the coolest thing ever. Um, it's on one of my exterior hard drive or external hard drives and I couldn't find it because I was going to show you guys the video for this class, but um, super, super cool. So basically what they do is they have this mold basically that they kind of go up and they fit together and they have about an eight to 12 inch space in between them. And they have what looks like rebar that kind of holds the two pieces together. And then what they do is they come in with a cement truck and they fill the spaces in between the walls or in between the two panels with concrete. So again, all these panels come in, they snap together, kind of like a giant jigsaw puzzle. And then they come in and fill the whole thing in with concrete. And what's interesting is they do this on interior walls as well. So where now you just have the, just two sheets of drywall with a stud in the middle and wiring and all that. They actually come in, do all the electrical in between the walls and all of that. And then they pour the concrete right around the plumbing and all of that. So very, very efficient, super energy efficient, and just kind of a really cool process. Now they use that insulated concrete that fills it to make it super, super rigid. So these things will stand up to a cat five hurricane and the only thing that might happen is the roof might get ripped off. The rest of these things are not going anywhere. So they don't use trees. So wood frame, timber frame, obviously you're having to cut down trees for the wood. Um, on some of the others, they use a lot of plastic components. And whereas with this, they don't use any of that. So it's very environmentally friendly. It is expensive. So compared to a block home or something like that, it is a bit more expensive, but the homeowner is going to save some of that expense each year in their energy efficiency costs. So it does end up paying for itself over time. So it becomes a discussion about how long do you wanna live in this house as to whether or not it is a worthwhile investment, I guess would be the right way to say it. The other cool thing is it's highly resistant to fire and to insects. So because you have those interior walls that also have that concrete form, fire doesn't spread. You know, drywall is going to burn, but concrete really doesn't. So it is very fire resistant. And obviously you're not going to have termites or bugs or rodents in a solid concrete form. So it's really kind of a cool thing. It's becoming kind of an emerging technology, but something that I really believe we're going to start seeing a lot more of in the coming years. So in the event that you guys have somebody that's like, oh, we have a concrete form home, you kind of understand what it is and, and some of the benefits of it. Now, concrete masonry units. So this is more of what we call a block home. It's very common, very typical in Florida specifically. Uh, it's used to create an environmentally resistant structure. So again, you have these blocks, they have huge pieces of rebar that go down in them to create rigidity, uh, very hurricane resistant, things like that. That's why it's a very popular building type in Florida specifically, especially on properties that are near the water. You know, wood and water don't mix. That's just kind of chemistry, physics 101. So these concrete block homes tend to be more desirable than a a wood frame home, although the wood frame has been around for a hundred years, actually more than that, probably a couple hundred years. And a lot of the homes that you see that are a hundred or 200 years old are all wood frame homes. So they're built to last. Concrete block homes are also very efficient. They have a lot of pros and cons. But I have a lot of buyers who used to come to me and go, I absolutely do not want a wood frame home. And so when I asked, well, why not? Ultimately, what it came down to was the story of the three little pigs. The first one built their house out of straw, it blew over. Second one built their house out of sticks, it blew over. 
third one built the house out of brick, it stayed. So in their mind, from the time we've been children, we've been taught that wood homes don't hold up. And that's really just not the case. So I'm not one who shies away from wood frame homes, but there are a lot of people who go, well, you're gonna have termite issues. Okay, maybe, but you just do a termite protection plan and it's not a big deal. These homes have been around for a very long period of time. And I know that there are others and maybe some of you that would actually argue with me that no, wood frame homes are not as strong or not as desirable as block. And honestly, you might have a valid point. But in the end, it doesn't necessarily matter what type of, of home it is. There are homes that are built to last and there are homes that are built as cheaply and as quickly as possible and they're not built with the same craftsmanship. So whether you're talking block homes, brick, or not brick, brick is not a real exterior building material in Florida, um, block homes, wood frame homes, uh, concrete form, whatever it is, there are pros and cons to all of them. So at the end of the day, we just need to understand the differences in the materials and let the buyer ultimately decide whether or not that's something they're comfortable moving forward with. But I want you guys to be able to understand that Block homes are not necessarily any better than wood frame homes. So just my little soapbox rant. Now, typically these block homes are built on slab on grade. So what that means is, excuse me, I got hiccups, that these blocks are actually built on a concrete slab. They could actually still be built on wood frame as well. And it looks like we have a question here. Let me move this down here. Uh, okay, so they said it's harder to change later or remodel or add on. Oh, are you talking about the concrete form? Yes, you wouldn't be able to change it or really do an addition to that. And Lori said, I heard there's a difference in the insurance costs. I've heard that too. From my experience, what I've found is that while there may be a difference in the insurance cost, if you have a block home and a wood frame home right next door to each other, from my experience, the insurance costs are fairly comparable. So there may be some variance, but it's not like wood frame homes are 10% more expensive to insure than block homes. In Florida, I've just not found that to be the case, but I've heard that too. Oh, block homes are cheaper to insure. From what I found, that hasn't been the case. And I'd be interested to talk to somebody in insurance to get a definitive answer on that. And maybe I'll try to do that for you guys. And I'll post it in the Facebook group um, to find out if there is, if all things are created equal, a 2,000 square foot, three bedroom, two bathroom house, you know, whatever it is, would it on identical lots next door to each other, would there be a significant cost in insurance? So let me find out about that because that's a, you know, it's a valid point. Newer wood frame homes use termite resistant technology. Absolutely right. Um, a lot of the new wood frame, they actually treat it. And sometimes they have tubes that they put through the exterior walls so that the termite control company can literally go to the exterior of the house, use a high pressure hose and pump the material through it. And then all of a sudden now you don't have any problems with termites whatsoever because the wood and the entire exterior actually get treated right from the time it's being built. So that's a great point. I'm glad you mentioned that. Thank you. Now let's talk about steel stud homes. Now this is something that has absolutely fascinated me and I've never had the opportunity to see one. Steel stud construction, construction is popular with commercial buildings. We see this a lot in warehouses and um, storehouses and things like that. But there are now builders that are actually using steel frame construction for homes. It uses the same techniques as wood frame. So you're gonna have support structures and things like that. But instead of the wood, it uses steel studs. Instead of nailing into the wood, they actually use screws. So it helps hold it all together and it makes it a stronger structure. But once you put stucco and roof on it, it is absolutely indistinguishable from a, a wood frame home, which is kind of cool. Now, again, no wood, no pests, no termites, you know, there's a lot of things to be said. 
the other trade-off to this is a steel home is probably going to be heavier than a wood frame home comparatively. So you'll wanna make sure that you may have to have a thicker concrete slab to be able to support the weight of the steel, but really that's the only difference I found in terms of what would have to change if you were gonna build a wood frame home or a steel frame home. Steel stud construction is also resistant to fire and insects, which is why people choose it. Fire resistance is actually something that has been kind of a hot button issue in real estate lately. Uh, and I don't really know why. Uh, I understand in places like California where the wildfires have been an issue and things like that, but it's really come into the conversation a lot in real estate circles, probably in the last three to five years. Um, so what builders are doing is they are looking at what materials can we use to help in the fire resistance to make homes safer. Because fires are a common occurrence, but they've been a common occurrence for a really long time. So I'm not sure why all of a sudden it's become kind of a conversation, but honestly, I'm kind of glad it is. In Florida, moisture and pests are common concerns among buyers regarding wood frame homes, especially people from up north. Now, anybody who's lived here for more than five minutes understands that the majority of the buyers that we have in Florida aren't from Florida. They're from Boston, they're from Philly, they're from New York, they're from Michigan, they're from Minnesota, they're from, you know, wherever. We have a lot of transplants. So up north, brick homes are very, very common. People come down and go, I want a brick home. Well, brick homes largely don't exist in Florida um, because of humidity, because of moisture, because of pests. All these things really come in and play a factor into our building materials. So we are very unique in the style of homes that we have and all of those things because we're just totally different than pretty much anywhere else in the country. Now, the other thing that I wanted to point out is in two story homes, there are builders that do block for both stories, but more often than not, you're going to see a block on the first floor and then wood frame for the second floor. Um, I don't know if it's a weight issue. I don't know if it's a structure issue. Uh, I've never been able to get a true answer to the question, but typically what you're gonna see is block on the first floor, wood frame on the second. That's just kind of what they do. Excuse me. Metal frame is growing in popularity as is the insulated concrete because of the environmentally conscious nature of younger buyers. So our younger buyers, I won't call them millennials, even though really that's kind of what, what we're talking about. Um, they tend to be very, very environmentally conscious. So there are things like that, that as builders are starting to cater to the younger people, those are things that are being taken into account. And then we had a question that says, I've used steel construction or used steel in commercial construction and the steel studding is lighter foot to foot than what wood is. So that's really interesting um, because I didn't know that. Um, it's also more flexible, which again, when we're talking about areas of high wind and things like that, um, is valuable. And then Edwin asks, what are slab foundations, or why are, yeah, why are slab foundations considered better than pier foundations? Okay, so this is the deal. On a slab foundation, the idea is that the weight of the home is distributed across an entire footprint. Whereas in piers, you know, it's done at stress points. So in the event that one of those piers is not 100% structurally sound or something like that, you have what are now stress points in the areas between those two piers. So that's why people perceive a slab to be better. In reality, it's probably not. What I have found and what I actually would do if I were building a home is when they pour the foundation, you can have a structural engineer that puts these braided uh, rebar, for lack of a better term, wires through the foundation. 
And then what happens is as the concrete is drying, that structural engineer tightens those wires to a certain resistance. And what it does then is it basically makes the entire foundation one cohesive piece. So in the event that I were to get a sinkhole in the back corner of this home, this house is going to be completely structurally sound because I have reinforcement all the way through that this entire slab is reinforced. So unless the entire ground falls from under this house, it is basically what they call sinkhole proof. Nothing, I mean, it's kind of like saying a ship is unsinkable. Nothing is ever proof, anything proof, fireproof, waterproof, windproof, but it does add a significant margin of error to that. And then I have another question. Um, how value-wise does stem wall foundation compare to a floating slab? And that's actually a really good question that I don't know the answer to. Um, it's actually a question I've never even thought to ask. Um, that would be a really good question for a builder or a developer uh, to kind of find out because honestly, I'm really not sure. Um, hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, talking about exterior construction, regardless of what type of construction it is, once the exterior goes up, it's very, very hard to tell. So this is something that I get a lot. In the previous listing, the house was listed as a block home because the seller was told it was a block home. And then all of a sudden they somehow find out that no, it's actually a wood frame home. Now, you can climb up in the attic and go to the exterior and you can typically tell is it block or is it wood by the way that it's attached to the roof? Um, but a lot of people don't do that. Wood frame homes, block homes, steel frame homes, all those things can have the exact same exterior look. They can have stucco, they can have hardy board, they can have some sort of um, flanking, they can have block or stone facades. They could look absolutely identical. So it can sometimes be difficult to tell once the outside is completed. Um, that being said, there is a record of what type of construction material was used. So it just may take a little bit of digging to figure that out. But when it comes to exterior, so again, we have four different types of stucco here in the top left. In the bottom left, we have kind of a stone facade like we have on both of the two, the bottom left two pictures. Um, and then we have kind of a, a siding above it. So we have a shingle siding, log siding, board and batten, shake, vertical, blended, Dutch clapboard. All of these are different types of siding that you can put on a home. So, um, and then actually somebody said, sometimes you can pull an electrical plate off and see what type of construction is used. That's an awesome, awesome suggestion. Thank you. Nedman says, aren't the exterior doorways wider in block home versus wood frame home? Um, in most cases, yes, but not always. So that's where it gets to be kind of a, you know, a rule of thumb, but not always. Uh, then in this bottom right photo, you see that you have kind of the uh, block home with a brick facade. So once you put the brick on, then it's very hard to tell what's underneath it. So again, in the end, it doesn't necessarily matter, at least in my opinion, the exterior construction type as much as who built it, how it was built, you know, the quality of the build, things like that. And in new construction, that can sometimes be hard to tell. So in terms of exterior building types and things like that, do we have any questions before we move on? Um, and then Edwin said, I've seen in the tax records where it says the exterior construction, sometimes it says wood frame or block. Yes, um, most of the time it's in there, but I have seen, instances where the exterior construction material is either not there or that it was input incorrectly. So it's a good place to start. And that's typically what I suggest you do is go into the tax records and start there. Um, but understand that I have seen instances in my years in real estate where it has been wrong. All right, so let's start talking about roofs. 
There are six main roof types in Florida, shingled roof, clay or tile roof, wood shakes, fiber enforced concrete tiles, slate roofs, and metal roofs. Now, the shingled roofs are very affordable and are the most common type of roofing material in Florida. They're durable, they hold up well to wind and rain, typically made of asphalt or fiberglass. And if a shingle does blow off in a storm, they can be replaced. They come in many colors and styles and they have different year names. So what I mean is you can have a 20 year tile, a 30 year tile. I've seen as many as a 40 year tile, by tile I mean shingle, 30 year shingle, 40 year shingle. In Florida, I don't care what kind of shingle you have and I've gotten this from multiple roofers. In Florida, you're gonna get 20 years out of a roof. That's just the, the ballpark. Now the neighborhood I live in, all of the homes were built in 2001, 2002. And right now the roofing company is making a fortune because every single house in the neighborhood is getting a new roof, including mine. Mine's gonna be getting a roof here as soon as the insurance company decides to figure out what they're doing. So 20 years, I don't care if it's a 30 year dimensional shingle, blah, 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 blah. It's a 20 year roof. You might get 25, maybe, but they're 20 year roofs. A 20 year shingle, you might get 15, but pretty much all of the roofers now are using a 30 year dimensional shingle. And all dimensional means is like you see here, one layer lays over the next. So as the water runs down, it has a harder time intruding back up and under. Um, the exception would be in areas where there is pooling, you know, where water is pooling, then it might get up and under. But guys, just understand, if you're looking at a house, especially for purposes of FHA, if the roof is 18, 19, 20 years old, I don't care that it says there's a 30-year shingle on it, the inspector is going to give you less than five years of usable life. Just understand for FHA, that's going to be what it is. So as long as you understand and you can have that conversation with the seller, typically everything goes fine. Clay or tile roofs are extremely long lasting. They're durable and they age very well. Now guys, I've seen kind of like up here in the top left, I've seen a tile roof that was 40 years old and still functioned like it was brand new. Um, let me have a question here. See if I can grab it. There we go. Um, Let's see, we had a listing that had an original tile roof that was not leaking, but had multiple cracked tiles. The house was built in the 70s. So that's exactly what I was just about to talk about. On the tile roofs, the water protection has nothing to do with this tile. It is actually a layer that is under this that the tile gets laid on top of. So what's really cool is you can have a cracked tile and still not have a roof leak because that underlay is what keeps the water out. Now here's the really beautiful thing about this. Because the tiles sit on top of that protective layer, that underlay is very, very slow to wear out. So it doesn't get exposed to direct sunlight. It doesn't get exposed to a lot of water. It will last 50 years. Roof tiles, uh, tile roofs rather, can last 50 years easily and not have any problems whatsoever. So yes, they are extremely expensive to put on. A new tile roof might be 30, 40, $50,000 or more. But if you're doing three roof replacements of a shingled roof over the same time of a tile roof, if you're willing to live in the house long enough, it might make it worthwhile. You know, and let's say an average roof is fifteen to twenty thousand dollars, which is kind of what the roof on my house is quoted at between fifteen and twenty thousand. Um, you could pay forty, forty five thousand for a roof that's going to last three shingle roofs, you know, twenty, forty, sixty years. If I wanted to stay in my house for the rest of my life, yeah, I'd probably go ahead and invest and put on a tile roof. But it all becomes that cost comparison. The other cool thing with tile is it doesn't rot or burn. So holds up very well. Like any tile, it does need some maintenance, but not very often. Now here's what I'll tell you guys. If you have a listing with a tile roof 
do not let that inspector walk on that tile roof because here's what's going to happen. That inspector is not going to know where to walk on those tiles and they're going to crack about 20 of them as they're walking around. What I would tell you is have a home inspector that can use a drone and actually pop up and do a tile roof inspection with a drone. Do not walk on a tile roof because if you don't know where to stand, you are going to crack every tile you step on. They're very, very fragile. So roofers who work on the tile roofs know where to walk on them so they don't crack them, but a lot of home inspectors do not. So that's just something to be aware of. If you have a buyer that is buying a, an, a home with a tile roof, I typically ask that the inspector not walk on the roof. Because again, it just causes more issues than it fixes. And then, like I said, they can be a little bit pricey. Now, wood shake roofs. We don't see a ton of these, but they are so cool. They're really stylish and very natural in a way that suits character homes. So this is not something that your general like ABC builder is going to stick on every home, but some of your custom builders are using them. Um, they're individual, they're beautiful, and they're environmentally friendly. So a lot of times these roof tiles are actually made from recycled wood. So it's a really energy efficient way to get a cool look out of a roof. They're pretty energy saving as they allow a house to breathe and they circulate air easily throughout the house. They also insulate the attic. Now, it's not to say that they're not without downsides. They're wood, so you have to maintain them. You have to seal them. Um, in sealing them, if you take care of this roof, they last a very, very long time. But as with all wood, they can't get too wet, they can't get too dry, and wood burns. So it's, it's a trade-off. Um, but you see this a lot in cottages, you see this a lot in kind of really unique one-off homes. Some of the tree houses and stuff will actually have these kinds of roofs. So they're very cool. I kind of like them, especially the one here on the left that looks a little bit like an Alice in Wonderland kind of thing where they're all different shapes and sizes and it's very whimsical. Uh, the two on the right have a much more uniform look, so you get kind of that uniformity that you would expect out of a tile roof, uh, but they're just different, and so the people that have them want something different. Now, this is something I was not really familiar with, but it was kind of intriguing as I was building this class. It's called a fiber-enforced concrete tile. So you can find shingles, you can find simulated wood shakes, and a lightweight concrete tile that are all made out of a fiber or fiber reinforced concrete. So they're very durable, they have a good lifespan, and they don't need a lot of maintenance because they're concrete. So they can be made to look like a tile roof, they can be made to look like a wood shake roof, they can have these different like metal roof looks, but it's all done with the concrete. And where a real wood shake may not always be fire resistant, simulated concrete wood shake is. They're coated with a plastic or enamel, so they're not super environmentally friendly, but they look good, they're reasonably priced, and very low maintenance. So it's something that if you did have to replace a roof, it might be something worth looking at. Like I said, it's not something I was familiar with, but as I started digging and looking into them, <coughs> <clears throat> sorry, um, they're really kind of a cool option and one that I think is going to start growing in popularity. Now, slate roofs. <clears throat> oh, sorry about that. Okay, slate roofs are very, very stylish, but they're super, super expensive. So you're only going to find them on really high-end homes. It's low maintenance, it doesn't rot, it offers good water protection, and it's natural and does well with lots of water, even at hurricane force. So they hold up extremely well. Uh, there are many types and varieties and colors and things like that that you can do. So like over here, you've got some blues and some pinks and some whites and grays and browns and blacks. So you have a very cool looking roof, but they are super expensive. 
Uh, I saw one because I was trying to find one that specifically had a slate roof. And I found one down in Coral Gables, down in the Miami area. And it said the slate roof was over $100,000 on a 3,000 square foot home. So they are extremely expensive, but they are super cool. A con is that it's both heavy and expensive and being heavy, the roof may need some extra support. And then we have metal roofs. Now metal roofs, you typically think of like, at least I always did, those log cabins with the green sheets of metal across the top. That's what I always imagined a metal roof to look like or kind of what you get on flat roofs where you just have that corrugated metal that just lays across it. But what I found was they actually have new metal roofs that look like tile or look like um, shingles. So you can actually have a roof that is metal but looks like a normal shingled roof. It's very limited maintenance, very long lasting, but expensive. So some of these metal roofs might be twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars, but they last thirty to forty, even sometimes up to fifty years. What I found with a metal roof is the metal itself doesn't wear out. The screws or the nails that hold it in place actually rust out, and that's what causes the water leakage and things like that. Is that it's actually what the tiles are attached to the roof with that wear out before the roof itself. So just something to be aware of. Now, there are many types of roofing options. If the home sits in an HOA, there may be limitations to the type of roof that you can use in that particular HOA. So it may be that you have to have a tile roof or you have to have a shingled roof but you might be able to get away with a metal shingle or a metal tile or something like that so that the aesthetic remains the same, but you get kind of a different quality material. So in the event that the home does sit in an HOA, you will need to confirm to make sure that what you're looking at doing will meet their approval. You have a variety of budgets, even within types. So when it comes to a shingle roof, you could do one type of shingle that might be ten or twelve thousand dollars, and another type of shingle that might be twenty-two to twenty-five thousand dollars. So it's it's not super cut and dry. It's not a a shingle roof is twenty thousand dollars is twenty thousand dollars is twenty thousand dollars. It's just it doesn't work that way. So understand that getting multiple quotes and things like that would be helpful and beneficial. There are other types of roofs, but because of the crazy temperatures and climate swings that we experience in Florida, they simply aren't practical. So up north, there are other types of roofs that are used, or roof materials rather, uh, that are used in building, but in Florida, we just don't use them because we have hurricanes, we have rain, and over the course of a day, we can have a 50 or 60 degree swing from the morning to the afternoon. And you know, we've, anybody who's lived here more than five minutes knows Florida weather is crazy bipolar. So that's just kind of what it is. When it comes to roof, what do you guys have in terms of questions? Give me a second before we move on. Nothing? All right. So let's go on to patios and porches. Now, <clears throat> There's a few types of porches or patios that we're going to find in Florida. A patio, a porch, a lanai, a lot of these things get used interchangeably. So I kind of, I use it in, uh, people use it interchangeably, I guess I should say. And Lori just popped in and said she has a metal roof that saves a lot of money on her electric bill. And that's another factor that I didn't put into metal roofs, but you're absolutely right. Um, so when it comes to patios, porches, those kinds of things, we have primarily five. Florida rooms, covered patios, uncovered patios, lanais, and wood porches. There may be others, but these are the main ones that you're going to encounter. So this is what we'll, we'll kind of focus on today. The first one is a Florida room. So typically these are almost always fully enclosed patios that are usually open to the rest of the house. 
It's typically a conversion that occurs at some period after the home is built where climate control gets added into the space to make it part of the actual living space. But in order to be counted as living square footage, it must be properly permitted. Um, and Edwin said, what about flat roofs? From experience, they can increase your insurance. So I didn't really get into flat roofs because typically they're only over like porch areas and not normally over living spaces. But in the event, like in this example, where we have a Florida room with a flat roof, so it is over a living space, then yes, it could impact your insurance. Although I can't quantify, you know, specifically how much of an impact that would have. Um, but yes, flat roofs are more expensive to insure and they last a significantly lower period of time. So a flat roof is like 10 years max, just kind of as a rule of thumb. So Florida rooms are something that are very, very popular because it adds to that Florida lifestyle. Typically, they're going to have a lot of windows because originally this was all screened or maybe it had vinyl windows or something like that. And they go in and actually put in real windows. They finish it. They make it look like the rest of the hall. They put in real flooring. Um, it's very popular in Florida, as the name would suggest, to convert to a Florida room. Uh, but ultimately, this is still a patio or a porch area that was enclosed and finished to turn it into a Florida room. Excuse me, sorry. For covered patios. Okay, so a covered patio is sometimes called a, a three-season room. Uh, it has some sort of concrete foundation, and it's covered by a roof. It may be open to the outside elements, or it may be enclosed by windows or screens. So it's different than a Florida room in that it typically still has a door that goes out to the porch or patio. So the exterior door remains in the home. Um, and it's typically covered. So we have things like in the top left here, this sunshade that drops down. Um, it can be retracted. So this would come up or down. Sometimes you have where it may be enclosed on one side, but open to the other. A lot of times it'll have electric out there, so you'll have ceiling fans or things like that to make it more habitable. Or sometimes you have things like this where it's open on all three sides and still connected to the house, but you would still have fans or lights or something up here as well. And so that's why they're called three season rooms. You probably don't want to use them in June, July, August, but for the rest of the year, you know, it's kind of a nice place to, to be outside and enjoy that Florida lifestyle. And then you have uncovered patios. So as the name suggests, it's a patio that's uncovered. It may be attached to the foundation of the home or it may not be. Typically, it's going to have a sitting area, sometimes with a garden or a meditative setting. It has no overhead covering and is exposed to the elements. And it typically has some sort of concrete or tile area that defines it. So it's not just usually a grass area. You know, it usually has some sort of foundation or something that is defining that space. And Laurie said, when I encounter added on Florida rooms that were previously a porch, I personally adjust down the price per square foot from the rest of the house due to different construction materials and roof type. And appraiser gave that tip. And that's a great suggestion. Um, because again, the way that somebody pours the foundation of a home versus the foundation of a patio or a garage is different. They are not typically the same foundation. So that is a good suggestion. Um, and Lori, I don't know if you know how much of an adjustment per square foot do you use kind of a, a ballpark percentage or is it just kind of based on the price of the home? So 50%. Okay. Um, that's something to, to absolutely encounter or something to factor rather when you're pricing a home is if you do have that converted space to kind of factor in that as an adjustment when we're pricing it because an appraiser may adjust that down as well. Now, when it comes to a lanai, lanais are typically what we find in Florida. So it's going to be defined as having a partially covered area 
with an enclosed screened area. So it may or may not have a pool, but it is almost always attached to the foundation of the home. So I gave two examples here. These are both considered lanai's. They have this covered porch area right up against the house. And then they also have an uncovered porch area or a screened in area. Um, typically to be a lanai, it's gonna be fully screened in. And then wood porches. So wood porches, we don't see quite as much in Florida as we do up north and in other areas, um, but we do see them on uh, property that has a slope, especially in the backyard. They're also found on many waterfront properties and they're almost always uncovered. So you'll have these wood porches, you'll notice in the picture in the top right, as this land slopes off, they use these stairs to kind of create some elevated areas. Uh, same thing on this waterfront property. They use these wood docks, uh, not a dock really, but these wood porches to create that kind of lifestyle feel that you wouldn't get otherwise. And Edwin said, is a Florida room considered part of the square footage if there's not an AC vent, but it's still part of the living room space? So that's where it gets to be a little bit of a maybe, but maybe not on kind of a case by case. So if it is a climate controlled space, then it could be counted in the living square footage. But if it is not, then it may or may not be. So I know that that's kind of a vague and ambiguous answer. And unfortunately, that's the best answer I have is that if it is climate controlled and it is open to the rest of the house, then it is typically counted in the square footage. Although to Lori's point, it may bring that cost of that area down in terms of price per square foot. But in the event that it is not climate controlled, that's not to say that it can't be counted, but it is less likely to be counted. And I hope that makes sense. So wood porches, again, not something we see a lot, but I have seen them specifically on homes down in, um, Clearwater, Indian Rocks Beach, kind of that area, I've noticed there are a lot of homes that instead of having pavered porches, they actually have this kind of pressure treated wood porch. So it's just kind of a different feel. Now, there are different types of porches and patios that you can see as you show more homes. There's not really an ideal type of porch or patio. It comes down to preference. Most people want a lanai. They want it screened in so they don't get the bugs. They've got a covered area, so if it's raining, they can still use the outside area, which is why we see a lot of lanai's in Florida. But it's not to say that every buyer that comes in here specifically wants a lanai. So just something to keep in mind. And the biggest thing that is, if there is a patio conversion, kind of like we've been talking about, to ensure that it's permitted and the same with garage conversions. Otherwise, you cannot use that in the, the square footage factors. Does anybody have any questions about porches, patios, lanai's, anything like that? Um, Lori said, wood porches could also be composite wood and add more value to a Trex-like product. Yes, thank you. I actually meant to do a slide on this when I was doing it and somehow I forgot. Um, there are different types of wood and then including some composite woods. So you're absolutely right. The maintenance on a cedar or a pine or something like that is gonna be exponentially more than on those composites. And those composite wood is significantly more desirable than the timber wood, you know, tree wood, I guess, um, counterparts. So yes, thank you, Lori. I'm glad that you touched on that. And then, um, Edwin said, I had an appraiser tell me that they did not include the Florida room as heated square footage because there were sliding glass doors between the living and Florida room. Exactly. So that's what I was saying is in a Florida room, you would have to actually take those doors off to have it be considered. Otherwise, they look at it as a porch conversion or a patio conversion. And because there's still a sliding door that separates it, it is not considered living square footage because it's not open to the rest of the home. So it does kind of get to be a question of, do I want this open to the home? Am I gonna go through the expense of taking those doors off, taking part of that wall out 
and opening it up to make it more a cohesive piece of the space. So those are all extremely valid points. Now let's talk about landscaping. Now I will be the first to admit I pay somebody to do my lawn. I am not a landscaper. I don't pull weeds. I could kill a cactus. I have the blackest thumb that has ever existed. So when it comes to landscaping, I'm going to tell you guys what I read because my personal knowledge on this is extremely limited. Um, there are a couple of schools of thought on landscaping specifically in Florida. Um, four of them, one is called less is more. One is called selecting the right type of plants for the climate, accentuating the features that already exist, and then creating a setting. So these are kind of the four ways that landscapers come into how they landscape a property. So the first one is less is more. They use a few key pieces or a few key placed trees or bushes to kind of create that showcase. And we see this a lot. It's very simple, it's very easy to maintain. And sometimes they use little pops of color like they did here in these baskets by the front door to kind of help bring a little bit of pop to the front. Um, this actually is my preference of landscaping. I'm not big on, you know, tons of flowers, tons of trees, tons of bushes, garden, lush, whatever. That's just not me personally. Um, this is actually, if I had to do it, this is what I would do. But again, there are a lot of people who want something totally different. Um, and then Edwin says, do appraisers count landscaping and the value or, or is it more of a personal appeal? So from my experience, the appraiser does not give a ton of value to the landscaping. Um, there are a couple of exceptions. Sometimes the value of palm trees, because palm trees are stupid expensive. Um, sometimes they will give a little bit more value for landscaping if there's like three $50,000 palm trees or something out front, then maybe. Um, but by and large, no. Landscaping is just the curb appeal to a buyer. It's how desirable that home is going to be to a prospective buyer. So. That's a good question. The next one is selective plants based on climate. So again, in Florida, we're very arid. We have a ton of direct sunlight and we have periods where it rains every day. And then we have periods where we don't get rain for two months. So a lot of landscapers will pick plants and trees and bushes that are able to thrive in that variant. They can handle a lot of direct sun. They can handle periods of dry. They can handle periods of tons of rain. So they're very environmentally conscious in terms of you know, the impact that it has. You don't necessarily have to water them, those kinds of things. And it's true with some, excuse me, some of the grasses that they use as well. Then you have accentuating features. So landscapers or landscape artists will use plants that coordinate with home features, columns, window placement, things like that. Some people have started using ivy on things like front arches to be able to add some character to the home. Taller homes may benefit from skinny tall trees out front. You know, if you've got a two-story home but you have this giant oak tree that covers the entire front of the house, it may actually diminish some of that curb appeal. So you might have things like these trees in the bottom photo that are very tall and skinny that don't diminish from the look of that home, if that makes sense. Or you have what's called creating a setting. So tropical oasis, secret garden, things like that. A landscaper will actually come in and create or invoke, evoke, evoke a emotional response. So things like this garden setting where you have this gazebo with ivy and you know these very lush landscapes or these bright tropical flowers around a pool or a walkway. It's done specifically to create that setting. And in doing so, it can really help with 
kind of getting a buyer to feel a certain way about a property using the landscaping to accomplish that. Now, a suggestion that Cherise gave me actually that I hadn't considered was to pay attention to what new construction neighborhoods are doing for their landscaping. They are spending buku dollars on landscaping these new communities and they do tons and tons and tons of research to figure out what's going to draw people in. So it's a good idea to just drive through some of these neighborhoods and just see what kind of landscaping they're doing. Uh, because that might be a good indicator of what would be worth copying in a similar area. So I thought that was a really good suggestion. And then, do we have any, uh, we'll talk about marketing in the MLS, but if you guys have any questions about landscaping, I'll do my best to answer them. But like I said, landscaping is the one area where I just, yeah, I, I don't do landscaping. I just, it's not my thing. Um, but when we talk about how to market this, so in appliances and in interior features, there's a lot of things we can really do to showcase those in the MLS. Um, in this case, talking about the age of the roof is important, especially if it's newer. Um, the building materials, the things like that, they're a little bit harder. Oh, good. Sorry. They're a lot harder to showcase than in previous areas that we've talked about. Um, but understanding the difference, understanding the differences in type of roof and type of material and things like that um, is helpful and it is important. And then would having a cleaned up lake bank increase property value versus having an overgrown area? Um, typically, yes. I mean, there's always some inherent value of having waterfront property. But yes, if you can clean that up now, let me back up for a second. There are some plant species that cannot be cleaned up without permits and permissions and all sorts of things. So I would say yes with an asterisk and the asterisk being make sure that you are legally allowed to clean up that bank and to get rid of whatever that plant species is that's growing on the bank because you may not be able to. So, um, in the case of the building material, sellers may not even really be sure. Is it block? Is it wood frame? Is it, you know, whatever. So do the best you can to verify the info and tax records and things like that. And then in your public remarks, tell a story. So I can't tell you how many times I've gone into the MLS and it says three bedroom, two bathroom, two car garage, roof 2010, um, water heater 2016, air conditioner 2012. Okay, so those are all facts, but does that make you wanna jump out and go look at this home? Doesn't me, and I'm hyper logical. I want to know the facts, but I use somebody who writes up a story for my public remarks. And what I mean is, welcome to Casa, Toscano, whatever. You can call it Casa, whatever the street name is, as long as it's something nice sounding. Um, give it a name. It doesn't matter what the name is. This beautiful three bedroom, two bathroom home with an oversized two car garage is just waiting for you to come enjoy. I don't know. As you can tell, I don't write this stuff. Um, but tell the story. Give your home a reason for people to want to come in and see it. Include the facts. Make sure that the facts are there, but tell a story. So in marketing features and things like that, that's where I would leave with you guys because there's not a lot I can really tell you about what you put in the public remarks about block homes, stucco, things like that. But just tell a story. Make sure that you would want to come see that home to make sure you write it in such a way that you would want to come see it so that others would as well. And then Lori said, I live on a lake and it's necessary to have a permit to clear certain weeds and plants. And yes, some plants are protected. It's more desirable to have a cleaned up bank, but it can be expensive to have someone clear it out. And that's exactly right. I'm glad you said that. Um, because it just, it's, it's all kind of a give and take. So there are some things we can do, things we can't do. 
But at the end of the day, guys, it's just important to really understand that there are a million different ways that we can market a property. There are a million different ways that we can kind of keep all of this stuff going. But at the end of the day, the real value comes from what is it that would make me want to come see this home? And if you can tell me what that is, you can attract the buyer for it. So that's what I want to leave you guys. I hope that, um, you know, this, these four parts were helpful for you. The other three have been posted to um, YouTube. And then I think I've got them all in the back office. If not, when I put this one in, I'll make sure that all of them are in the back office. Um, does anybody have any questions? Gerselli said, oak trees are super expensive to remove and they destroy a foundation, which is true. Um, if it's planted too close to the foundation of a home, then yes, they can. Um, but, you know, again, oak trees are kind of really desirable to a lot of the people too. So, you know, there's give and take. Uh, does anybody else have any questions? No? All right. Well, thank you guys for being here. As always, I sincerely appreciate showing, showing up, showing up for the classes. Uh, if there's anything else like this, you know, this was a suggestion that somebody had brought and they said, hey, I'd like to know, you know, I'm a new agent. I haven't done a lot of listings. I'd really like to know about these features. How do I do that? Um, and so I went in and built the, the four classes specifically for that. So if something comes to mind and you guys are like, hey, I'd really like to learn this. This is something I don't know. I can't find anywhere. Bring it to us and we'll just build the class around it. So as always, thank you so much for being here. I do sincerely appreciate it. I hope you have an amazing week. And if there's anything we can do for you, just let us know. We'll talk to you soon. Have a great day.